For this lecture, we're going to be grouping um, a handful of infections together because they all fall under the neonatal meningitis. So those of you listening to this are going to be clinicians, MD, PA, nurse practitioner, nurse, whatever. In a clinical setting, you're going to see um, an infant few weeks, few months, maybe up to a year or so, two at the tops, who's going to present in your clinic and your ER, whatever, and they are showing the clinical signs of meningitis. The problem is with an infant, you can't sit there and ask, how bad does this hurt? When does it hurt? Can you move this way? So the thing that they're going to teach you, especially if you go into pediatrics or, or emergency medicine, is how to recognize the symptoms in a baby, a nonverbal child. Well, you know, if you've never really played with a baby or had a baby of your own, you're going to notice that young children, young babies, especially when they're crying, have a tendency to move their head around, shake their head, especially within they're in pain or something's causing them distress. It's just one of those things we humans do. Well, if you have a stiff neck and you can't touch your chin to your chest, you're not gonna be able to shake your head either. So you're gonna see a baby who's gonna be laying there stiff as a board, their head, neck, trunk all in line, crying, irritable, high fever. So it's one of those things that clinicians have to watch out for. When mommy or daddy, the new mommy, new daddy, then panic brings their baby to the ER or to your clinic. We find that premature babies seem to have a predisposition for neonatal meningitis. Their chances of getting it are greater than an infant that was carried to full term. What we, from um, an immunological standpoint, what we see here is uh, preemies, their immune system hasn't developed to the point that you would see in a full-term baby. A full-term baby, their immune system hasn't developed yet to the point of what you would see in a one-year-old baby. By the age of two, it's even further developed compared to, you know, what has, you know, earlier in life and so on. Most common causes. Group B strep, we talked about this in an earlier lecture, Streptococcus agalaceae. Escherichia coli, E. coli, which is kind of interesting because E. coli resides in our large intestine. It is an enteric bacteria. And Listeria monocytogenes, which we talked about in a previous lecture. So when you look at group B streps, specifically strep agalaceae. You're going to find that in 10 to 30 percent of female genital tracts, okay? So this is going to be something the infant is exposed to as it passes out the birth canal. It will start colonizing and it will overgrow certain areas and then begin somehow get in the blood and settle out on the meninges. Penicillin G, it's one of these that penicillin still works great against, thank goodness. Um, for those of you who are thinking OB, either OB nurse, OB nurse practitioner, PA, MD, whatever. Um, high risk women, women that, you know, um, Oh, shoot. I forget what their 
basically reading the book, I'm drawing a blank right now on criteria for high risk from the woman's standpoint. Now, why they don't just test everybody, I don't know. But usually around 35 to 37 weeks of gestation, okay? In the second half of the third trimester is when you really want to look at this. If mom is a carrier for this, she happens to be that 10 to 30 percent female of the female population that's a carrier of this, that's colonized by this, they're going to start IV antibiotics at the beginning of labor. Okay, Start IV antibiotics, uh, broad spectrum, hardcore, basically knock down the normal flora. Okay, Knock down the normal flora so that as the baby passes out through the birth canal, it's minimal what's still there that will now be colonizing the baby. Uh, generally, like I said, it's penicillin G, but if there is a penicillin allergy, erythromycin still works. Another neonatal meningitis, Escherichia coli, strain K1. Okay, you'll see that E. coli, again, E. coli is like the other bacteria we've talked about in this chapter and previous chapters where there's different strains, different serotypes. O15H7 um, is a great example. That's the bloody diarrhea one that we'll talk about in two chapters from now, I believe. The K1 strain is a strain that has been shown to be predominant, the predominant cause of neonatal meningitis. K1 strain neonatal meningitis is going to be you know, one you see in preemies. And even with treatment, even aggressive treatment, a 20 to 30% mortality rate. 100% fatal, no treatment, I do believe is the numbers. Treatment, you knock that down to 20, 30% chance of fatality. Here's the scary part. Yes, the fatality rate is still quite high, but of those that survive, there will be some brain damage. And that's the scary part. That's why if you are going to be an OBGYN or you are going to be a pediatrician specializing in newborns, neonates, this is going to be one that's always going to be on your radar. Vertical transmission. Mom's birth canal, again, is going to be the source. This is not one that's communicable. Okay, just because you're holding the baby doesn't mean you're going to expose them to it generally. This is going to be one that um, the E. coli is going to somehow get from mom's large intestine, her rectum, anal region to the vagina. Okay, um, I know that sounds weird, but that's honestly, that's how a lot of women's urinary tract infections occurs. Um, e. coli, either poor hygiene or it somehow is able to do the run and tumble to get up to towards the genital urinary tract. Another one, and this one I'm not quite uh, familiar with, I will admit. Uh, Chronobacter sakazakii, sakazakii, Enterobacter sakazakii. You'll notice sometimes they will go through and they will change the names of um, organisms as they start to study them and start to go through and characterize. Here's what the genes are present. Here's the, you know, the chromosomal structure. Here's the sequence of the genes. Here's their abilities. Oh, hey, guess what? It's more closely related to group, to this group than the group it was in. So they'll switch it over, new genus, new name. 
But while that's a pain in the butt for, you know, us biologists, for clinicians, it's also something they have to keep in, you know, keep up to date with. Um, because as you are sitting there discussing, telling patients, especially in this day and age, you tell a patient they have a Enterobacter Sazaki, Sakazaki um, infection, they're going to write it down, they're going to do the Google, and they're not going to find it. Or they're going to see it's something new, and then they're going to start to question the clinician. You know, why didn't you know this? And they're going to start to not have as much faith in their doctors as you know as you would hope they would not be as trusting now this one's not vertical so much this one is uh, a problem with powdered milk the formula that we you that all parents will use at some point in time um, it's a contaminant a contamination in the formula itself. So you go, you add the water, you mix the formula, you think you've done everything correctly, and you feed it to your baby. And next thing you know, they're starting to, sh you know, within a day or so, they're showing signs of meningitis. This one has a 40% mortality rate. That's 40% almost flip a coin percentage, even with treatment. No treatment, 100%. Uh, because of this, if um, hospitals and whatnot, they don't use the powdered milk anymore. They use ready-to-feed concentrated liquid formulas that have been you know, tested, that have been made sure there's nothing there so that way you know you're not the hospital itself isn't causing the meningitis a few years ago an up-and-coming scary 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 neonatal disease the zika virus Um, here, the swelling of the meninges is going to be in utero. Okay, mom will get exposed to a virus, the virus crosses the placenta, the virus proliferates in the developing fetus, leading to swelling of the meninges and an abnormal development of the head. So for the most part, for adults, mild at best disease, some skin rash, conjunctivitis, I mean, look at it, muscle pain, joint pain, they're going to feel like they got a bit of the flu, okay? Minimal to no fever. But it's going to, the problem's going to be the babies that acquire it during fetal development, okay? The small head, the, might, the smaller head is going to be, you know, 30 to 40 percent the size of the quote unquote normal head of a baby. Uh, because of this reduced size, reduced, um, reduced brain capacity, there will be severe, severe brain trauma. Okay, the brain will not develop correctly, which is going to lead to minimal, if any, frontal lobe development, um, higher brain functions, minimal at best, um, lower brain functions, you know, things that keeping the heart beating and all, you know, the body functioning will still be there, but those two can be affected. It's transmitted by a mosquito person to person by a mosquito. Um, there have been some reports that this is also can be um, transmitted person to person via um, sexual intercourse. So person A is infected, has sex with person B. Um, from what I've been able to find, person A has to be male 
and during ejaculation that's when the virus is spread to person B female or male depending upon what they're doing and you know for the meningitis what we think of um, that you know the neonatal Zika virus disease that's going to have to be a vertical in utero transmission so far um, up to mid 19 or I'm sorry mid 2017 at the time this book was I mean this part of the chapter was I guess initially written and they had been tracking 175 cases in the US um, the majority of those 174 of those were travelers to uh, regions where it's now becoming endemic and then they came back got pregnant or passed it via you know intercourse um, um, so right now that's something that it's on our radar but it's not a major uh, medical issue throughout the US as of yet uh, no vaccine um, basically the, any uh, treatments are going to be dependent upon who you're talking about if it's an adult who has this they're experiencing experiencing what's known as Gillian Barr syndrome um, that's the uh, the um, conjunctivitis you know swollen eyes the aches the pains the joints may or may not have rash or splotches around their body things like that uh, supportive care um, here's you know some low dose uh, antibiotics maybe if you know they think there might be you know susceptible secondary bacterial infection um, low dose um, steroids help you know modulate their immune response and then just tell them you know a leave for the pain as far as the neonates the babies uh, the infants there's really nothing that can be done damage was done you know weeks if not months before during fetal development and there's nothing that can be done now other than um, supportive care um, help would make sure that you know there's nothing physical you know hearts okay breathing's okay stuff like that nothing can be done um, to help with the uh, mental issues the higher brain function issues that those are just set